Well, welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today to discuss the national security imperative of secure networks. I'm Tatiana Bolton, the Managing Senior Fellow for R Street Cybersecurity and Emerging Threats Team. Uh, the R Street Institute is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy research organization, uh, and our mission is to engage in policy research and outreach to promote free markets and limited effective government. Before we turn to zero trust networks and encryption, I first wanted to announce a new pledge that our street cybersecurity and emerging threats team has taken. We have committed to no longer hosting white male only panels as part of our efforts to improve the diversity of the cyber policy field. We believe and I believe very strongly that diversity is security. And while this is a small step towards the inclusion of underrepresented communities in the cybersecurity arena, it will hopefully contribute to a broader recognition that diversity, equity, and inclusion are critical to society's broader economic development, well being, and security. And now I have the honor to introduce today's panelists. Joining me for our discussion, uh, we have uh, two preeminent experts in the field and one hopefully to join us shortly. Uh, Chris Inglis is the former deputy director of the National Security Agency uh, and the co current commissioner for the Cyberspace Solarium Commission where I had the pleasure to work with him and the Robert and Mary Ann Looker Professor in Cybersecurity Studies at the United States Naval Academy. Uh, also with us today is Kieran Martin, uh, who is the former CEO of the UK's National Cybersecurity Center, a global security expert and the managing director at Paladin Capital Group, and also a professor at the University of Oxford. Uh, we also hopefully will uh, have with us shortly Wendy Nather, head of the advi advisory CISOs and duo security at Cisco. So uh, I will start with uh, Karen, a question to you. Uh, what are zero trust networks and how does this idea differ from the traditional ways of thinking about cybersecurity? Well, thanks Tatiana <clears throat> for the um, introduction and the invite and um, Bravo was, I think, someone in the chat about uh, has said on your decision on panels. I think that's um, very welcome and uh, something that would uh, fully support. And indeed, uh, hopefully we will not be, um, other than your own chairing of this, we will not be an all-male panel in, uh, uh, very, very shortly. And I think um, Wendy would probably give a better answer to this. So, you know, come back to her as and when uh, she joins. But um, in my view, I mean, the National Cybersecurity Centre in the UK, when I um, headed it, um, embrace the uh, zero trust and I was going to say the concept of zero trust networks because to me it's more of a concept than a um, than if, if you like a, a service and how does it differ um, well I think look semantics occasionally can be important and there's a difference between trust and trustworthiness you know we may come on to things like you know um, supply chain and 5g and so on a bit later but it's a useful way to think about it uh, trustworthy will mean things like the intent of an organization a company and so for uh, an example you know do you trust its board of directors its adherence to the rule of law it's not quite the same thing in security architecture terms as trust you know uh, there is a piece of metal um, uh, uh, with some software around it transmitting data uh, do you, it is built uh, and operated by human beings do you trust that uh, well you may think that it comes from trustworthy sources but at the same time networks are inherently uh, vulnerable they fail by accident so if you look at you know um, some of the NCSC's uh, design principles for critical infrastructure whether it's telecoms or anything else uh, you assume that any piece of equipment can fail and you can um, by accident and you assume that any um, <clears throat> um, piece of equipment can be um, uh, malevolently taken over and I think that's a good way of, of uh, starting uh, about this. Um, so if you think about, um, and another way of looking at it, if you look at, uh, there are a number of reasons, and I won't go into all of them, there are a number of reasons why banks and big financial institutions are the best protected by and large in the private sector anywhere in the world. Um, as I say, multiple reasons for that, but one of them is about um, concepts of trust. So if you look at uh, banking had a head start in when cybersecurity came along as a thing, because banking had for a couple of decades had to regulate against insider trading and so-called fat finger trading. So one is deliberately malicious activity, the other is accidental uh, harmful activity. But the principle is the same. Somebody who isn't um, acting in your interest uh, is uh, has been given control. What 
is there to stop them doing untold total catastrophic damage. And I think that's, if you like, where Zero Trust comes from. So I'm not going to uh, do a sales pitch for an organization I no longer lead. But if you are uh, interested in, um, uh, you know, the UK government's thinking about this, um, we've published a series of things over the over the months and years, including an update of um, zero trust principles just at the end of October. Uh, the untrusting eight, as they're called, um, you know, things that you need to do to uh, operate um, zero trust. So things like knowing your architecture, using policies to authorize requests, authentication everywhere, um, not trusting any networks, including your own, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think that is different from assuming I've bought this, it's verified, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, or it comes from somewhere I like, or it comes from a friend. Uh, that. You know, I think that is a contributory part. I'm not knocking that, but I think Zero Trust takes it further in a, in a helpful way. Absolutely, um, and thank you for that. Uh, so I think that kind of leads me to the question, to my next question um, to Chris. How has 5G uh, and the Internet of Things sort of forced us to change the way we think about security? Um, I think that obviously that is a different paradigm um, than what we were living in 15, uh, even 10 years ago. Yeah, so again, thanks for the forum. And I too hope that uh, when we're all done, it will be, it will be more than uh, just Karen and I here. So um, you know, here, here's to getting Wendy on the line as soon as possible. Um, I'd like to compliment what Karen has said and then perhaps go into the question you've asked about 5G. First, with respect to uh, zero trust, uh, my, my own view is that while um, the diffusion of network assets and the erosion of what we used to know or used to think was a perimeter have accelerated the sense that we need to have a new security paradigm. I think what's old is new again. Um, we've always known that we can't have confidence in the trust of a system um, that, that is dynamic and that constantly morphs moment by moment. And we've learned time and time again that simply the person, the human being is a component of that system um, that has a, a huge discretion as to what activities they might undertake, you might call that the insider threat, uh, makes it such that you can't presume that trust you has established at some specific point in time, be that in the design phase or maybe at the identification authentication moment, is sustained over time. And so what I think Zero Trust does is go back and to say, um, we, we should have trust at, at various moments in the life cycle of a digital infrastructure that includes human beings, but we should verify. You know, it's as, it's as old as that concept, which is trust but verify. Um, taking that forward then into 5G, um, I think any anyone who's seen an advertisement to the commercial consumer about 5G <clears throat> knows that this portends this massive introduction of faster, reliable communications. Anybody who has a smartphone is just longing for the day when you look at it. And in the upper right-hand corner, it no longer says two bars 4G or kind of one bar 2G. Um, but, but it essentially says you're on 5G. Um, but it also portends the massive deployments of sensors and, and an incredible density of those sensors, considerably more than communications devices that human beings might kind of recognize. Um, and therefore, I think 5G is really more about um, an incredible reach of the network and an incredible increase in the functions, the fidelity of those functions, the utility of those functions to things as kind of widespread as um, the transfer of critical material, be that electricity or water flows, um, the transfer of financial activities, um, the management of cars that are increasingly autonomous on the road. It's going to be about reach and function more than speed. Um, so if that's the case, we then have to look at the implementation of 5G to kind of begin to understand how we imbue it with the trust necessary. Um, so it's going to be massively diffused. The perimeter goes away. It's going to be a loss of hierarchy that we once knew. So you can't have some hypervisor that essentially is in charge of all matters of extending trust. Um, and it portends kind of a massive kind of introduction of what we have traditionally called the Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything. It will have great responsibility for human functions. So I think that then means that um, following along the kind of playbook of zero trust networks, we have to make sure that we have uh, standards up front that are well defined, not simply for security, but to make sure that the principles of the societies that we're a part of 
So free and open tends to be kind of one of the mantras of the United States, the United Kingdom and others similarly like-minded um, kind of nation states. And that those standards also support the market forces that we want to see because 5G is not a monolithic, monolithic thing. It's gonna be, I wouldn't wanna say a Star Wars bar, but that kind of sometimes comes to mind um, of a very diverse set of capabilities that are put together, right? For whatever the purpose of the moment might be. So establishing that trust through standards, establishing that trust by looking at the devices themselves and understanding whether they're worthy of playing a role in a trusted network, a trusted network whose trust is sustained over time by analytics and a sense of how they're being employed, not simply how they're being deposed or kind of, um, kind of array, arrayed across a broader network. I think 5G will be a case in point, um, an exemplar of whether we get zero trust um, network design right or wrong. Great. Well, thank you very much. And Wendy, uh, welcome to you. Uh, I've uh, sort of introduced you here at the beginning, but um, uh, but welcome. And uh, I'm going to follow up uh, very quickly with uh, what Chris just said, and then uh, we'll we'll uh, take it to you, Wendy, for a question. Um, how, Chris, uh, you know, you said what's old is new again. How has your experience, or your uh, your previous experience at the NSA, sort of informed your understanding of um, of zero trust networks and sort of um, making sure that we trust those um, within our networks? Well, so I, I got started at the National Security Agency in uh, late 1985. I think it was the dawn of time. We didn't think we were working cyber cybersecurity in the day, but but we were. Um, I was in something called the NCSC, strangely enough. It was at the time known as the National Computer Security Center. Um, and its job was to um, help the private sector develop what we, what we in the day would have called secure computers. We actually went so far as to try to mathematically prove that those computers were secure and that that security was um, unimpeachable. Um, it was a fool's errand. It was a useful thing to pursue. It was a nice aspiration, but we ultimately determined that um, it was sufficiently complex from kind of whether it was the basic features of the, um, the hardware, the firmware, um, to the software, which was then converted by a compiler into you know, something perhaps more abstract, ultimately down to the machine code. But ultimately, when the human being came into contact with a network, then the network's very design changed over time. We even in the middle 1980s knew that what we needed was something that we today call um, zero trust networks. We had to actually kind of figure out how do you imbue trust by designing it such that it might be trustworthy but operating it such that you sustain that trust um, and you challenge that trust um, all the time. Um, the idea that something can be made secure and then set into harm's way um, and stay that way, um, it, it surprises you know, one operator after another when they come back and they look at the equivalent of broken glass on the floor on a Monday morning and they say, what happened? Um, life happened, right? So, so I think that's what I learned as much or more as anything else um, which is that you can actually extend trust, but you have to verify it continuously, constantly, whether that's for a human being or a part. Um, I think the standard still today is true. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that um, certainly that's the mindset of the intelligence community, and I think that that uh, would be wise to kind of take uh, into cybersecurity more broadly and the culture of the United States. Um, Wendy, um, sort of to follow up with uh, what Chris said, which is that, uh, you know, we sort of had this, uh, these ideas around for a while. What is it about zero trust networks that, um, you know, we've, we've had them around, but we haven't seen great adoption. So what sorts of challenges are preventing the implementation of this and a broader adoption? Well, it, it's true that the, the idea has been around for a long time. Um, the Jericho Forum, a group of, of financial institution CISOs, uh, 20 years ago uh, came out with the idea of what, what if we treated everything as if it were on the open, unprotected internet, and what would that look like? And I remember as a CISO at the time saying, well, they're right, but I have no idea how I would implement this. But in the meantime, um, first of all, they called it deperimeterization, which is very hard to say after a couple of pints of beer. So I think that's why it didn't catch on. Uh, and then John Kindervog, when he was at Forrester, coined the term zero trust, which is much easier to say at three in the morning. So never underestimate the power of marketing, first of all. 
as an idea, but also we've evolved a lot of additional technology that has made it more um, reasonable to try to achieve this goal. There are things like micro segmentation on the network layer. There are things like uh, secure enclaves on phones so that we can perform more cryptographic functions for authentication without having to involve the user, uh, which has led to the rise of protocols like WebAuthn. So that is a very big step uh, because as was pointed out, whenever you have a human in the equation, things start to go south. Um, so with all of these additional developments, it is looking more, uh, more possible to implement the idea of zero trust, both at the network layer and at any other layer, sometimes just the application layer is enough. So all of these things are coming together to help adoption and as a result, uh, in some research that we just did at Cisco, we saw um, about 39% of 4,800 respondents globally saying that they were going all in to zero trust. And another approximately 39% said that they were starting on that journey. So we are seeing adoption, but yes, it is a long complex uh, framework that you have to figure out how to adapt to you know, the, the environment that you have. And uh, so, and how would you say um, sort of uh, for our audience, how does encryption play um, into, into zero trust networks? And, uh, you know, can you have zero trust networks without strong encryption? Well, in, encryption obviously protects the session, protects against uh, attacks and, and hijacking on that, uh, on the session itself. This is especially important now that we're using more cloud and we have discovered in the past that many providers didn't actually encrypt their traffic within the cloud. Um, you know, we've treated it as a black box and kind of assumed they were doing the right thing when they weren't. So uh, it, it's definitely an important part of zero trust in that you need to make sure of the integrity of your traffic and of your data when when you are receiving it and when you are uh, sending it again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Karen, sort of, I wanted to go over to you and talk to you about uh, how Europe sees these two issues, zero trust networks and, and encryption. Um, because obviously I, I think that uh, it's fair to say that the United States um, has a different view than the UK and, and as well as Europe and our other allies and partners. Yeah, and there's no homogenous view within the continent of Europe and you know, the UK being now outside the European Union and part of the Five Eyes Alliance has perhaps a slightly contrarian position within that. And of course, you know, societies within themselves are, um, you know, have divisions. But I think, I mean, on the encryption issue, I mean, I think um, uh, amongst many uh, valuable remarks that Wendy's made, um, I think, you know, reminding us that it's not just about end to end encryption of essentially social media platforms and messaging services uh, is really important, you know, from a cybersecurity point of view, the sort of thing she's talking about, about encryption within the cloud um, uh, and so forth, uh, you know, network encryption and so on is, 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 is really quite important. And I think that helps in some respects. I mean, the attitude that I take personally speaking, happily speaking only for myself rather than, you know, a country or let alone you know the European uh, Union um, I mean in terms of the end-to-end -end encryption debate and, and that sort of thing I mean look, firstly it cannot be uh, uninvented and uh, drivers for strong security are to be are, are to be welcomed um, in terms of the then debate about you know law enforcement intelligence capabilities and so forth I think um, there is a different um, tone in, uh, in in Europe. Of course, you know Europe doesn't provide, by and large, the platforms and the services. I mean, they're mostly American. Um, so uh, to that end, it's a slightly it's a slightly strange debate. Um, I think you know if I can characterize potentially some <clears throat> assumptions that are challengeable on both on, on 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 both sides. On the European side, I think there is a stronger acceptance that. You know, ubiquitous end-to-end -end encryption does have real uh, uh, damaging uh, consequences for aspects of law enforcement and so forth. Uh, and there is a, in 
various quarters a reluctance to accept that it is absolutely technically mathematically impossible to do things like you know exceptional access under uh, law in a way without wrecking the whole system i think the weakness of that argument is that that may well be true providing you don't try and claim that it's still end-to-end -end encryption because it isn't even things like quorum key escrow are not end-to-end -end encryption because it involves the creation of something called a key now it may be a perfectly valid way of doing things and a lot of us um uh, people would say it's not, but you know what it isn't is end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, but I think um, uh, in 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 Europe, I think there is a sense of at least trying to explore acceptable technical means means which don't wreck uh, privacy, which don't wreck uh, security. But I think the onus, um, the way I would characterize and the way I'm encouraging the discussion in Europe to go is. Um, I think you know US uh, privacy and civil liberties campaigners are absolutely right to say don't throw the child protection thing at us you know we do understand this you know we it is harmful we um but we're trying to you know um this is a technological necessity it's necessary for um uh, it, it it's it's necessary for the protection of digital communications it's necessary for the protection of us all um, I think, you know, for those who wish to get away from just um, for those who wish to modify uh, the modern posture and encryption, the real imperative is proves that something technically works in a way that can be uh, uh, used for, you know, lawful, judiciously um, uh, used um, uh, national security and law enforcement uh, purposes. Uh, if you can prove that, and it can be sort of technically verified and industry thinks it works and so forth, then you're going somewhere. If you can't, then don't, you know, I'm not sure what the what is to be gained by increasingly, you know, I can understand it, increasingly emotional sort of charges about the harm done. Having said all that, one thing I would say to US uh, colleagues on the other um, uh, side of the argument is that, um, you know, there are, um, I think there is sometimes very dismissive tones about the damaging real world consequences for law enforcement and national security agencies of ubiquitous end to end encryption. It is a fact that it is now standard procedure for most Western law enforcement agencies who are combating child sexual abuse online uh, to get large amounts of data from Facebook, which they will no longer be able to get. I mean, I think that's just a fact. It's not it's not scaremongering. It's not hype. Um, uh, so, you know, I think there needs to be a greater realization of that. But basically, the solution in this comes either technically or, or, or not at all. And I've always said that if it comes to it, you know, information, it, it, the balance of um, the, the, the default balance has to lie with better security. It has to lie with strong encryption. You know, we as societies have far more to gain from securing our own communication, securing our own digital infrastructure, whether that's through end-to-end -end encryption, whether that's through zero trust, whether it's through whatever it is, we have far more to gain by just having our own secure digital platforms uh, than by um, uh, than by exploiting the insecurities in, in, in others. So we should default uh, towards um, the, the, we should default in this case towards encryption. We should default towards uh, security, uh, unless there are good technical um, uh, mitigations in the other direction. That would be my view. Great, thank you. Um, and you know, Chris, you've spoken eloquently on a similar, you know, similar topics about the balancing balancing the aims of both sides and sort of fairly representing their goals. Um, can you? sort of talk to us about about that yeah, um thank you um and thanks kieran for uh you know, once again a very thoughtful uh, rendering of that i i think that the american perspective and i will speak uh, both about an american perspective but then be clear about where i kind of enter into a personal perspective is more alike than not um, the European perspective, let alone the United Kingdom perspective, where we tend to be very close on our, um, our practices as much as our aspirations. Um, I think that uh, on the matter of uh, this very specific question, um, the use of encryption, um, and I'll draw from the Solarium report, I have to clearly acknowledge what Karen said, which is it's an essential component. Um, of security in, in a world where we really don't have sanctuaries based upon physical perimeters. Um, there's an incredible diffusion, not simply of the assets that we use, but the data that it contains, which um, kind of represents um, the, the core uh, secrets of, of individuals, companies, um, and ultimately the command and control data that allows us to do life critical functions. So encryption plays a very critical role in that, um, not simply in end-to-end -end purposes, but 
identification, authentication, confidentiality for data at rest, and so on and so forth. In a cloud world, the Solarium Commission kind of acknowledged that encryption is an essential part of that, and we should strongly um, advocate and pursue that. Um, but having said that, the Solarium Commission also um, kind of declared that we need to understand what society's aspirations are in a perhaps more fulsome way. Um, when you look at the Constitution or similar documents broadly across uh, like-minded societies, um, they typically call out an aspiration to not simply the defense of individual um, kind of activities, privacy, liberties, things of that sort, but the collective responsibility that a government has to provide for the defense of its citizens. Um, and so kind of put in another way, um, you know, we don't have an or between those two propositions. We want to actually have an and. We want to do both of those things. And the question on the table is whether technology can be bent to the purpose of trying to figure out how do we have the requisite privacy and the defense of civil liberties, but at the same time, not allow one individual to use those technologies to the detriment of another? How do we pursue at the same time the security of our citizens, um, be it the kind of the classic um, call for how do we defeat child pornography, organized crime, or things of that sort? Uh, that there are threats to society that attend to the misuse of technology. My own sense is that the Solarium Commission called for um, um, kind of trying to figure out what our standard of um, performance should be, trying to figure out how would we grade a result. Um, and the Solarium Commission said that we should figure out if society's aspirations are for both of those propositions, the defense of civil liberties and the pursuit of collective security, uh, we should strive to figure out whether technology can meet the need. And I don't think in, in my own view, now going to Chris Inglis's view, that we've actually exhausted those possibilities. Um, we shouldn't impose a solution that biases it to one side or the other before we've determined that that is actually um, through a series of exhaustive um, inquiries, the only way that we can move forward. There is a third component that, that comes into play um, beyond um, a society aspiring to the defense of its citizens, civil liberties, and the kind of defense of collective security, we have to make sure in this world that we have market viability, that the systems that we build and sell can work not simply within a given um, sanctuary and given nation state, but across national boundaries. Otherwise, they will have no viability in delivering those services uh, because it still is a first to market. It still is kind of an economy of scale world. And we have to make sure that companies who build and deploy these things can work across those national boundaries. Which means, I think, that this has to be an international solution um, as opposed to a nation state only solution. So we should first work then to rationalize, reconcile those societal aspirations. We they should then figure out how to come up with an international agreement about what that standard of performance should be and then charge the technologists to figure out if they can deliver all of that. Um, to Kieran's point, it may well be that we say, you know, we're going to fall short on some aspects of it. And if you have to choose between your children, um, then the defense of privacy, civil liberty, the defense of the individual kind of um, merits, um, I think are nose ahead first right in line. But we'll have to figure out how to use other remedies to deliver the collective security and to hold um, perhaps um, at, at risk those who would use those technologies to our collective harm. I wish, like everyone else on the Stellarium Commission, that we'd come up with a solution on it. We didn't spend as much time um, as, as what would be needed. It might take another 10 years, frankly, to come up with a technical solution to that. But we did offer, not for the first time, um, perhaps a principled basis to say how to think about this. Tatiana? Thank you. Yes. And again, as always, uh, very eloquent on that topic. Um, I'm going to ask a couple more questions, but I uh, do want to open it up to the audience. If you all have any questions of your own, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen and uh, feel free to put those questions in and I'll be happy to ask them as we move forward. Um, so, Wendy, uh, Chris mentioned uh, viability, product viability, and um, including security into products. Um, and and obviously the international market, um, because we don't just, you know, obviously Cisco, right, does not just sell to the United States. Um, can you talk about that from an industry perspective, what you're seeing as challenges, whether including cybersecurity and selling, uh, selling products that have uh, more uh, security built in, uh, you know, is becoming more viable or is that still a, a, a big challenge? 
Uh, it's definitely getting better. And um, it, over time, we've seen a lot of basic security functions that are now being built in at the operating system level or at the application level. What I think we're going to be cha challenged with and, and are already challenged with in, in the next 10 to 20 years is the usability of those functions by people other than technologists. Uh, technology is now in everyone's hands. It is now democratized and therefore we need to democratize security. This means that we need to move away from an authoritarian model of security where so one person or some group, one body decides what the security requirements are and imposes them on the rest of, of the population. First of all, users are starting to take over control uh, either gracefully or not so gracefully by going around uh, and evading the, the security controls that we have in place. But also um, security is no longer predicated on somebody having a job, being told by their employer what security rules they have to follow using technology that is controlled by that employer. Um, and so we are seeing technology being used for any and all purposes, not just for criminal purposes as we've been discussing up until now, but uh, you know, for purposes of activism, everyday life and so on. Uh, so we need to empower people to be able to make their own dis security decisions, whatever you know, they need it for at their walks of life, doctors, farmers, artists, um, you know, people of any age. And that is um, why I think a lot of the discussion that we have about technological answers to these societal issues, even though the originating problem is technology like encryption, uh, we always have to be able to put a, um, a human element, a human decision-making element as close to the use of that technology as possible. And that's what we try to construct as CISOs. You know, we say, yes, we can technically do this, but we want to have a human gate in there to make the decision as to whether we can um, you know, want to make an exception for this, whether we want to make, uh, um, uh, you know, how, how we want to build this so that it's usable. So the, the end shot of this is that we have to build and evolve societal norms to deal with the technology questions that are being raised, not just can we build something that allows law enforcement also to um, get um, access to, to things, because I'm sure we can always find cases in which we agree on that. Uh, but we need to talk about things like, um, is it okay to move the goalposts on what's legal and illegal after the fact? And does that then require collecting all the data in case we decide later that uh, somebody you know, committed something or is about to commit something and we want to go look at them before they actually do anything. That's very minority report and that, that chills a lot of people. So with things like encryption or security controls, there is always a human somewhere at the, involved at the end. That's always the access point when you need access to something. But in a lot of cases, you either need to exploit the vulnerabilities of that human or you need their cooperation. And that's why building parallel societal norms is so important to go along with uh, the build, this technology. And here comes Chris with a, a much smarter answer, I'm sure. No, actually, I'd like to build on what you've said, if I might. I, I thought that was really well said. And, and I'd like to actually offer a very specific anecdote uh, that we all experienced uh, where I will be unduly critical um, because I wasn't actually a member of, of the event. Um, but you can kind of sit back and say, well, that was a harsh thing to say, Chris. But I think if you look back on the events of 2015, the San Bernardino event, um, where, where there was this perceived standoff between Apple Corporation and the FBI, my sense is that all sides missed an opportunity to do what you've just said, which is to try to figure out how do we actually combine forces to figure out what the societal aspirations are and align those as opposed to have those in contestation. Um, as you recall, right, there was an individual who got up one day and kind of committed murder and mayhem against his fellow citizens. 
he was killed in the event um, shortly after, therefore had no privacy rights per se. And the phone being owned by Bernardino, Bernardino County, um, they said, hey, by all means, get into that phone. So there really wasn't a question of privacy rights. Um, the real question on the table was whether Apple had some obligation, um, moral or legal, to assist the FBI in getting into that phone. Apple, um, I think, understanding that it had to appeal to a global market um, and having principles, um, said, no, we're not going to help you because that doesn't scale well, it doesn't scale to other governments or other situations. The FBI um, kind of then understanding that it could either pursue that in court or perhaps go out and have a mercenary hack the system, um, did the latter um, and they succeed. Um, they got into that iPhone 5. That was then the magic moment. Um, does the FBI, which um, declares fealty to all of the aspirations in the US Constitution, at that moment say, we've kind of understood now that there's no further plot. We've pursued to the rightful ends, this notion of collective security, but we now have this vulnerability that is actually an awful iPhone 5. And, and this vulnerability now being kind of discovered by one might be discovered by all. Um, it's a threat to the individual liberties, privacy of everyone. Do we now say we're going to put this on the table, push it across, give it um, to Apple such that the rising tide can raise all boats? Uh, they didn't do that. Um, so what you then have is this perception that Apple stands for privacy, the federal government stands for collective security, um, no one's really discussing the other elephant in the room about the market forces that are required to build and deploy solutions of this sort in an international context. Um, and there's this stunning missed opportunity um, for those two parties to essentially get together to say, what are we actually trying to achieve societally? Um, I think if we'd done that, we'd be in a better place today where we'd say, look, I think we can work together. It might not be that it's the technical solution one or the other party would have imagined going in, but it would be in combination a solution that would advance all interest. My sense is that we haven't worked hard enough to deliver those kind of collective um, aspirations. Uh, we've oftentimes reflexively sat back and said, I I'm just gonna go to the corner that I think I am principally responsible for. And through a division of effort, we've tried to deliver societal goals. We never will, it will never work. Do you think that um, the Cyberspace Solarium Commission, uh, hopefully as it gets extended and then and the um, NDAA, will take a look at any of these issues and uh, have more to say on encryption or zero trust networks, uh, or as you just mentioned, a vulnerability disclosure policy? I, I think it will almost certainly have more to say about zero trust networks, um, but, but I think on the matter of this, um, this issue of what do we do about you know encryption about aligning encryption's benefits which are enormous and essential and in, in the potential harm that accrues from the misuse of encryption i think the solarian commission while it would um kind of find that an attractive proposition it's not properly constituted at the moment to do that um, it doesn't have enough in my view representation um, from the kind of the persons parties organizations that would represent either those folks that say, look, I am strongly invested in privacy and civil liberties, not that the Solarian Commission wasn't, but, but when you look around the table, you wouldn't see someone who'd spent their life on the bleeding edge of that, nor does it have enough international representation to perhaps take that on to deliver a solution that would work in the international context. So can it be a force for that? I think so. Can it be an advocate for that? I think so. But I think it's gonna require a different venue and a different composition of, of diversity um, to actually try to deliver something that will be acceptable to all sides, if not accepted. Uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, Karen, I wanted to follow up on something Wendy said about um, empowering people to protect their own security. Um, I know that the NCSC has uh, worked on on that uh, in the UK, and um, I just wanted to, you know, ask you about uh, how we can how we can empower people. Um, to protect their own security when people uh, lack the technological background to understand how cybersecurity works? Um, well, uh, this is an incredibly rich discussion, thanks largely to the other two panelists. And just uh, I think, you know, what Chris has just said about San Bernardino is uh, very, very powerful. And I think um, there is something around whole of society efforts, which involve um, two things. Uh, one, which I'll come to in a minute, is trusting people a bit more. Uh, but the other is actually, you know, the odd surprise where someone steps out of their lane and does something that they're not expected to do. So, you know, for example, that counterfactual where the federal government says that 
we need to fix the iPhone 5 now that we've resolved the San Bernardino case is, is really, really powerful. And I think um, really welcome what he said, particularly the international dimension. But again, to pick up on the other point about trusting people, I mean, uh, Wendy has something about terminology, you know, about um, deprimitarization becoming zero trust. And also, I love the I love the phrase, the authoritarian model of uh, security. I think it's brilliant um, because it, I, I've been using this rubbish economics terms for years about producer capture, but authoritarian is better because we do have an authority. We have had an authoritarian model of security for the individual. It's been you want to get on my network. Here are my rules. The only problem is you want to get on 25 networks in a week or a day. Day, and you can't follow 25 sets of, of, of rules. And I think your question, Tatiana, is really gets to the point about, you know, how do you do this in a way that's not technical? Uh, one thing I think we did do at the NCSC in terms of narrative, as well as some of the technical um, stuff was <clears throat> we issued, and I'm quite proud of this, the phrase, we banned the phrase, we blogged against it, the phrase humans are the weak, people are the weakest link. Um, I would always say that it was like a sports fan, you know, saying my, my team would be great if it wasn't for the players. Uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> technology is a, is a human creation for use by humans. It is nothing else. Um, it, it is not at least yet, despite Hollywood's claims to the contrary, taken on a life of its own. And so if it doesn't work safely for people, then it doesn't work. And that is the test. Um, we can't afford it to be completely uh, anarchic, but we can't afford it to be authoritarian um, um, either. So, um, you know, uh, today's a good day to talk about this if you're in the UK and would encourage you just to have a glance at ncsc.gov.uk and no longer do it. But uh, today's the launch of something called the Cyber Aware Campaign. All countries have it. You know, you've got Cyber Awareness Month. The Canadians had, you know, a big cyber. Um, but on, on, in the UK side, you will see six things that everybody should be able to follow these days. I won't, you know, three of them are about passwords, you know, email passwords, keys to the kingdom, um, <clears throat> you know, the rest use the browser saves or a password manager, to, and, and it goes on, do backups, do 2FA, you know, that sort of thing. But six, six pretty simple uh, things that anybody can, um, uh, 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 can follow. And promoting that and promoting um, making that easy to use, um, you know, people being on national media from the government, which they were this morning saying, look, you know, your best bet if you're not a particularly vulnerable person online, you know, if you're the sysadmin for a major critical infrastructure company, obviously that's different. But if you're just an ordinary person with the ordinary uh, risk, then, you know, three random words that are unguessable to anyone but you is a good basis for a solid password for most things. Yeah, you know, that's quite that's quite good. And that's quite that's the opposite of authoritarian. That's empowering security. Again, Wendy's point about, um, you know, people um, that cybersecurity needs to be something that's done understandably by people whose priority is other things. You know, the three of us on this panel, by and large, are, you know, cybersecurity, security specialists of sort of one form or another. Most people aren't. Most people will just say, look, you know, how do I balance my risk so that I'm safe enough having taken a defendable set of personal risk judgments whilst I get on with the thing that motivates me in my life. Uh, and that's absolute, and everything has got to work in that basis. And so, you know, you need a set of commercial incentives, you need a set of, you know, educational narratives uh, and a set of product rules and regulations, both set by industry itself and as and when necessary by government. So IoT is a good example where governments are stepping in in a reasonably light touch way, but to say, look, you can't sell absolute garbage on the open market anymore. You know, it has to meet minimum product standards, a bit like automobiles. And that's quite right that governments are beginning to do that. If you do those three things, you've got a non-authoritarian but functional um, uh, model of security. And the final thing is, um, uh, and, you know, be interested in due course on, you know, um, both Chris and Wednesday's reflections on this, but my own experience of, from sort of opening up and liberalizing cybersecurity in the UK away from, you know, very classified, I mean, some of it is classified, the top end of the threat's classified, it requires classified intelligence to be able to get on top of it, it also requires classified capabilities sometimes to, um, to defend against it, but for the most part, we're talking about things that interact with the everyday consumer, and the more we tested being open about aspects of cybersecurity, whether that was releasing threat indicators, whether it was telling people about vulnerabilities, whatever it was, the more we trusted people, the better it got. We were always waiting for the big disaster where we'd accidentally declassify something, and it may well happen still, but we should hold our nerve because by and large, trusting people, giving them decent information, talking in reasonably simplified terms tended to work. So that shows the direction of travel um, to, um, you know, um, I'll look to Wendy to think up of a, you know, the sort of positive opposites phrase for authoritarian model of security, but um, I 
definitely believe that she's on to something with um, with that, and that's the direction that our, our sorts of free and open societies, to use Chris's phrase, should be following. Yeah, that would be democratizing security. Um, I gave a, a keynote on that at uh, RSA conference in the U.S. this year, and it's something that uh, it's a phrase that that we work towards, uh, you know, within Cisco, that people need to be able to make their own security decisions uh, and, and we need to redesign security in a way that they can do that and know how to do that. You mentioned IoT and, uh, and security issues and, and you might realize that over time as we evolve technology, we keep seeing the same security mistakes over and over again. And I believe that this is not because people are not learning, it's because it's a new demographic programming those technologies every time. When you have IoT, when you have internet connected trainers uh, or, or sneakers, um, which I've actually seen, you do not have the same security people programming the software for those as you did before. So of course they're going to make the same mistakes. That's why we need to make security part of everybody's life and everyone's decisions so that they can apply those principles no matter what they're doing because sooner or later, everyone will be faced with having to make these security questions. Uh, my, my 16 year old came to me the other day, I don't use parental controls, by the way, uh, at home. And she said, I need your help putting the parental controls on my phone. And I said, honey, why? And she, what she wanted to do was to enforce her own study hours. And she wanted to disable her own social media apps at the times when she knew she should be studying. So she set them the way she wanted them. I put on a password that she couldn't guess. And whenever she wants to change those, she comes back to me and I unlock it. But the key is she makes the decisions that are relevant for her. And this is what we should be teaching everyone at, at every age to be involved in security. And awareness will then come naturally from that. Wow, I mean, that that is an impressive young woman right there. And uh, I think I speak for everyone uh, to say that you should be everyone's cyber mom. That sounds great. Uh, Chris, uh, you were gonna jump in. Yeah, I'm impressed by that too, very impressed. Um, so I, I kind of support the general theme that, uh, that um, Wendy and Karen just walked through about information sharing. And I would point to two specific um, benefits, two things that then derive from that. Um, if we share data and methods, right, that are um, used to try to um, kind of proceed uh, with some sort of security. Uh, the first is that because we're transparent about that, um, we actually imbue trust. People will say, I, I think now understanding what you do, how you do it, what data you retain, I think I have at least a basis of trust of, you know, the authority that's been given to you to do that on my behalf. Back to the San Bernardino example. Um, if the FBI does retain that ability to get into iPhone 5, how do we know when and where they've used that? If we kind of let um, governmental entities essentially say, I will use zero day vulnerabilities or brute force to get into these things, trust me, I'll only do that when that's necessary. In my view, that's less viable as a basis of trust than saying, I understand what the technique is. I understand how that technique is controlled. Um, and I therefore will have some confidence that somebody is kind of writing herd on that. Uh, the second um, thing you get from information sharing, particularly if it's timely and granular, is you distribute the positive action that then accrues from that. Now, remember not long ago when um, the United Kingdom, the United States, a few others released very granular information about um, Russian actors um, who were doing ransomware attacks um, to say, you know, th these are the IP addresses they classically come from, these are the techniques they use, these are the signatures, and what that was was a field guide that allowed a kind of set of CISOs, maybe sometimes even ordinary users, um, at a very distributed, diffused kind of perimeter um, to understand I can now be an agent in the actioning against that. Um, I can help disrupt, right, those bad things that happen. I don't need to wait for a champion who alone has the discrete detailed information to step in and save me. There's not enough time in the day for those champions to do that. So we need to make sure we kind of mobilize and leverage everyone. Um, and so I think ultimately what sometimes argues against that is we don't have enough transparency because we, we think that perhaps those means and methods um, having been exposed to the adversaries, they'll be less useful. Uh, I think that's greatly overstated. 
Um, and we sometimes don't release granular timely information because we've made it so special to ourselves, it's proprietary or classified, that while we want to share it, we don't know how to share it. Um, my own experience has been that if you actually go to the reverse end of that, and again, um, Karen's heard me say this 100 times, but I'll say it again, the NCSC, the National Cybersecurity Center in the UK, has pioneered once again this amazingly productive capability, which is if you do this before it becomes proprietary, before it becomes enriched and classified, if you share at the lowest possible level, um, you can then use that information to the collective benefit because what happens off that floor plate is you enrich it with your proprietary information, you enrich it with your classified information and you act on it almost immediately. That's the way to perhaps kind of crowdsource adversaries who would otherwise use these technologies against us um, in a way that today they crowdsource us. That's a really interesting concept. Um, you know, so Chris, maybe this goes back to you, but I, you know, I sort of opened it up to the group. Um, in the United States, I mean, there are some organizations that do have existing capabilities that can, um, that they sometimes hold in reserve, right, for national security purposes. Um, but that's not all agencies, right? So, um, you know, how do we how do we know when and, and should we update our vulnerability disclosure policy to um, sort of to address the, the civil liberty con concerns um, and the law enforcement concerns? I mean, because some, you know, some people say like, how can you, um, how can you sort of blanket block uh, data that exists uh, that otherwise, if it wasn't digital, if it, if it wasn't on a computer or phone, wouldn't be blocked from like wiretapping, for example. There are certain um, law enforcement techniques that have been, um, that have been in existence. Um, how would you answer that question? Yeah, so first, should there be a process that kind of, you know, outside of the owner of one of those capabilities that you've described, tries to adjudicate, you know, what society's interests are of either allowing that capability to be retained by that kind of organization, let's say it's the National Security Agency, um, or whether we should kind of err in favor of shoring that up, fixing that vulnerability, such that the rising tide can raise all boats. Um, I think the answer is yes. Um, we have one in the United States. It was updated, I think, as recently as about five years ago. And I'm to understand that it works reasonably well. It might not have enough transparency such that everybody says, I agree, I'll put my thumbprint on that. Um, but, but we should, we can and should take a look at that to make sure it's serving our purposes and that it is impartial. It's nonpartisan in terms of it doesn't bias its efforts to favor one organization or another because it needs to serve society's needs. The second is um, what should be the kind of rules of discrimination as to how you decide. Um, and, and I think there's one general rule above all others, which is that if you find that you have a vulnerability that essentially accrues to everyone who makes use of that given capability, um, then you, you can't imagine that you're the only smart thing in the world, that the National Security Agency or whoever holds that is the only smart person who discovered that. You have to presume that others will discover that and therefore the bias has to be, we're gonna shore it up, we're gonna give it away. We're, we're gonna essentially make it such that we kind of protect everyone. Uh, the good news is, is that many of these vulnerabilities, these kind of flaws um, live not so much in some discrete technical feature, but rather in the context of its use, right? It's, it's whether some kind of party would make a mistake in its implementation, it can be used securely, they don't. Um, that they haven't patched it or they haven't actually shored it up with doctrine um, or behaviors that essentially make good use of it. And let's say, for example, um, that we find that a technology that doesn't have an inherent flaw when used properly is misused by some rogue nation state or kind of use the, um, the poster child, North Korea. Um, are we obligated to tell North Korea, you know, you're not using this properly when everybody else knows how to use that properly and they do, that would, in my view, be an easy call where we'd retain that vulnerability. Um, but if it's one that doesn't matter how you use it, it's flawed by design, we have to give that away. We have to have a huge bias to give that away. So A, there should be a process. B, there should be some metric that says, how do we pursue society's goals as opposed to the capabilities of a given institution? Um, and, and C, if, if there is a first among equals call, it needs to, I think, as Karen so thoughtfully said a while ago, we need to favor the collective whole as opposed to the interest of one institution. Absolutely. Um, so uh, I, I have time perhaps for two more questions and Karen, I'm gonna take it to you. Um, 
uh, this is from uh, the audience. Um, the, my, uh, the question is related to the necessity for international cooperation in an era of growing great power competition. What can the private sector do to prevent internet and technological fragmentation, particularly between the US and China, uh, and foster trust between all stakeholders to agree on global security standards? So there, I'll be brief, but there are three parts to that. So the, um, the first part is um, international cooperation on this space in pursuit of free and open technology is essential. Uh, the last bit, standards cooperation, is essential and doable. The middle bit about preventing fragmentation, particularly between the US and China, I'm not sure it is possible for the private sector or anybody else to prevent that. I think you know, there is a um, complete decoupling of supply chains and interdependency isn't going to happen overnight or possibly ever. But I think there will be an increasing um, uh, polarization, not least because, I mean, you know, um, a byproduct of the uh, Trump administration's pushback on um, uh, dependence on Chinese tech, which I think, you know, it has um, achieved um, uh, some good things in so doing, but a byproduct is a, a triggering a push towards self-sufficiency within China uh, itself, which in, in, in invariably leads to that, um, you know, at least partial uh, fragmentation. Um, I think therefore given, um, you know, the acceleration of an authority, you know, deeply concerning the authoritarian uh, model of technology, which does work for its creators in China. Um, the onus on um, the US <clears throat> alliance of like-minded nations is on um, making sure that we outcompete that, that we have you know technology that works, that commands public confidence, that is you know economically uh, efficient. I think um, you know that's been a struggle. Um, market conditions the last twenty years for both. Uh, normal, but also sometimes nefarious reasons of technology transfer, IP theft, and so forth have made that quite uh, difficult. I think, you know, speaking self critically, um, given the UK was in the EU for all this period, you know, regulation in Europe um, was all about consumer prices and lack of roaming charges on internet internet usage between member states it wasn't strategic and that's why we've got this position uh, now with the European um, body politic has been slightly upset at regulating American tech rather than looking at a the more authoritarian threat from China. So I think there is now, and you know, this is fairly recent with the US action and you know um, overtures from Europe and so forth about empowering ourselves, uh, building up our own capabilities, our own strategic capabilities, looking at um uh, looking at the standards bodies is a very, as to the question is a very important um uh, um uh, part of that. I think it's gonna you know, I mean, I think the, the challenge for the West and the US leadership is that, you know, all of this is a wonderful creation of, the, of you know, uh, of Western ideas of free markets, um, an, an American private sector led. <laughs> Maintaining it in the face of competition from a, an authoritarian state of one and a half billion people with a, deep pockets and technological capabilities is going to require you know, complicated strategic planning uh, and so forth. Chris mentioned some examples of that throughout history. So we're going to have to change some of the way we do business whilst at the same time protecting the free and open magic that got us to here in the first place. It's going to be hard, but it's not impossible. And I think, you know, the, the, seems, the, the conditions now are reasonably ripe for strong American leadership with more willing and grateful European partners than you might have been led to expect. We'll see. Oh, great. Well, uh, on that on that note, um, you know, thank you very much, all of you, for participating and our audience for tuning in. Um, I'd like to thank our panelists, Chris Inglis, Karen Martin, and Wendy Nather for joining us today. And uh, thank you very much. Have a lovely weekend. Thank you.